it's a very exciting time to be a wrestling fan. If you're in the business of making money, it would behoove you to be a safe and inclusive space. Whether you agree with what someone is saying has nothing to do with his right to say it. What doesn't kill us is making us stronger. We're gonna last longer than the greatest wall in China. Oh, that rabbit with a drum. If there's one thing that I love while waiting for my turn, it's that in each life's a rainfall. But you also get some sun. What's up, y'all? My name is Devonte, and I sacrificed my time so you don't have to. Let me ask you guys a question. Are you tired, at least at this point in time, are you tired of hearing people trying to gaslight you about professional wrestling, telling you things such as, we live in the best time of professional wrestling because of the actual wrestling in itself. The end rank component ends all. I know, tired, right? Been talking about it on my channel for years now, but it really hits you. It hits you like a ton of bricks, something a little bit different when you go back in the past and you watch some of these older wrestling shows, right? Shows that I grew up on nonetheless, but older shows nonetheless, right? And I'm seeing all this stuff from the Attitude Era, all this stuff from the Rufus Aggression Era. And hell, I even go back to the New Generation Era because I even appreciate that a hell of a lot more than what we see nowadays because at least there was diversity within the content, not within the people. Don't get it twisted. And, you know, it hits me like a ton of bricks seeing how much talent back in the days has so much order you know it wasn't just uh for the sake of going out there and just doing a match and you know no no there was order like i remember i hear i remember hearing stories such as owen hart for an example wanting to go out there as a heel and he wanted to outshine brett because he was more athletic and i think it was brett it was a couple of people telling owen hey no you can't go out there and you can't just go out there and outshine your brother at least not in this way because this is his bread and butter you need to find another way to outshine him in a different criteria that benefits not just him, not just you, but the entire match structure and therefore the company and the foreseen future, right? That's how professional wrestling used to be like. It wasn't just me, 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 right? The current generation of me. Oh, why can't you just go out there and just do your things to the best of your ability? Because when you love to the whims of doing things, certain things that to the best of your ability, when you go too far, there is such thing as too much right and that brings me to today's topic overall the midgets the quote-unquote vanilla midgets coined by kevin nash and let me tell you as a guy who grew up on guys such as eddie guerrero chris jericho chris benoit rob van dam ray mysterio kurt angle even if you want to say him i grew up on a lot of wrestlers who would be considered midgets now, obviously, in comparison to the average man, they aren't midgets. But within the professional wrestling structure, they're small. And it's one thing to be small and entertaining like these guys were. Hence why the vanilla midget thing always kind of rubbed people the wrong way. Because you're calling guys like Eddie Guerrero one of the best gimmicks of all time. A midget? A vanilla midget at that? Like, blasphemy. I remember when I heard that critique from Kevin Nash. Oh, my God. This would have been like, in what, sheesh, like 2007, 2008. I remember I heard that critique for the first time about Eddie, and I damn near pitched the fit. Like, how dare you? Eddie Guerrero is a legend. No blasphemy will be spoken upon the name of Eddie Guerrero. Viva la raza. No, you do not speak ill of Eddie. That's how I was when I was 15. And now I'm closing in on 32. And the more and more I start to think about it, and the more I look at the wrestlers nowadays, and the more and more I'm seeing just the the complete slap in the face of big man wrestlers. And I'm going to get to them in a little bit because I got more to say about that. The more and more I'm seeing is the more and more Kevin Nash is so goddamn right. 
it's almost to the point where I feel like Kevin Nash wasn't necessarily talking about the generation at the time, but more so warning us of the path of what we're gonna go, what we're heading down towards right now at the moment. That vanilla midget was a warning. It was a warning. Hey guys, you are doing a bunch of vanilla midget shit right now, and uh, it's starting to overtake professional wrestling. I remember he actually pinpointed, and I disagree with this, him saying Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero, that was the first pinpoint, that was the first, that was the bookmark of the downfall of professional wrestling. Because again, as I said with Eddie Guerrero, that's ludicrous if you take it to a context that he had a bunch of charisma, other things that wasn't just the wrestling. Eddie had to rely on a bunch of things outside of the wrestling because his body was getting to the point where he couldn't do what he used to do back in 1997, right? Well, Chris Benoit, obviously, I can understand that, and this is coming from a diehard Benoit mark. I can understand people sentiments towards that, but at the same time, also, at the very, very least, at the very least, if you want to call Benoit a vanilla midget, can I at least say, take out of context, obviously, him and how he wrestles. Go listen to The Undertaker on his Six Feet Under uh, podcast. He'll tell you Benoit wrestled like a goddamn big man. He was like probably five foot eight five foot nine but benoit would take it to you like he was brock lesnar probably even more intense go listen to kurt angle he said that himself but personality wise vanilla major i can see that about benoit but at the same time always remember benoit at the very 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 least them putting the world heavyweight champion on the so-called vanilla midget at least he was the first can we say that now, I know people may go back and say, oh, what about Bret Hart? No, not Bret Hart. Bret Hart had the shades. Bret Hart had the jacket. He had the catchphrase. You know, there were elements about Bret Hart that kind of, you know, takes him out of the vanilla midget category. Not to mention, people don't talk about this, but Bret Hart was kind of huge. I mean, don't let the stature fool you. Bret is actually kind of kind of big. But Benoit, I could see it, though. But again, he was the first. The first. And for a while, the only. There was no one as vanilla as Benoit when it comes to the character, uh, the character or the presentation. No one. Absolutely no one. And the problem is, again, he stood out. Today, everybody's a Chris Benoit. That's the problem. He stood out. He was all about sportsmanship. The, in the intensity. He was the only guy who could pull off wrestling means everything not to mention with benoit he is one of the best end rank performers in the history of the business it's not just going out there and throwing out sloppy joe superkick mcgee with the 450 splashes and then telling him that he, all he has to do is wrestle and that's all he needs in order to get over no benoit was genuinely one of the greatest wrestlers from an end ring perspective of all time he is considered one of the greatest wrestlers period of all time because of his end ring work so at the very least, if you're going to do the whole vanilla midget shit, at least put it on one of the best of all time. And that's what they did with Benoit at the very least. Can we say that? You look at today's professional wrestling and all I see every time I look around is excuses being made for people going out there and just bumping, just bumping for the sake of bumping. You have an entire company in AEW that circulates their entire fucking company around bumping. That's it. Can you take a move and can you give a move? Nothing else needs to be said about the wrestling in itself. Just can you take a move and can you give a move? Whatever you want to do, can you give it? And whatever you're going to do, can they take it? That's it. Is that not a problem to anybody? And again, this is what Kevin Nash was warning everybody about. You can sit here all you want to and you can pretend that, oh man, yeah, that wrestler right there. Yeah, he's great. Or this angle right here, it's one of the best of all time. And it's like, again, I talk about this all the time because it's such a poignant uh, example, in my opinion. When I talk about the bloodline story, I always talk about the fact that people get all giggly tits about it. It was a great story. It was an amazing angle. But like I said, we seen that shit all the time back in the days. Not that exact story, but the investment into the characters and the investment into the story, that was just an everyday thing a couple of years ago. Even as far back as, or even as late as probably like 15 years ago. If you go look at the Jericho and Shawn Michaels arc, like that was just something that we just engaged with. The presentation that built up around it, the feud in itself, the characters that were just, they were against each other. It was a protagonist and there was an antagonist and people loved the protagonist and people hated the antagonist. 
and you did things to cultivate to make sure that story sold. And then when you got to the pay-per-view, the blow off, that's when you went balls to the wall with the wrestling moves. Cause now you're focused on the match. Now the match has your attention. And it's like, all I see is a bunch of vanilla midges going out there, super kicking and Canadian destroying and frog splashing every goddamn five seconds. Dive here, dive there, dive there, dive here. And it's like, bruh, it, that, that cannot just be the end all be all for professional wrestling. You know, going back to WCW, you know what made WCW so awesome back in the days, at least for me? And the thing can be said about WWE in the year 2000, and I talked about this uh, not too much, I never really went too much in depth inside it, but I touched on it. You guys remember hearing me talk about this. What's the structure within the companies, right? It wasn't just the divisions of like world champion and then mid card champion. You might have two, whether it's the WCW United States champion or the TV title, or whether you have WWE and it's the Intercontinental Championship or the European Championship. You had your lower card titles or the Cruiserweight Championship or the Light Heavyweight Championship or the Hardcore Championship. You had your Women's Championship belts and you had your Tag Team Championship belts. Structure, actual structure, especially if you were a guy, because you'd go from the Tag Team Division to the European Championship Division to the Intercontinental Championship Division. It just made it that much more worthwhile when you finally won the World Heavyweight Championship. Look at someone like a Jeff Hardy. He did all that. He went in that manner. How he got to the top, he went from the Tag Team Division to the Hardcore Champion to the Cruiserweight Championship to the European Championship to the, to the Intercontinental Championship and then eventually the World Championship. And he did it within a time span of about, what, six or seven years? That's what made Jeff stand out so much more. It wasn't just going out there and it wasn't just bumping. People legitimately got invested into the character, right? And we talk about this all the time, but it's not just the, the structure of the divisions, right? Right. It's not just that structure. It's also knowing the participants and why they deserve to be in that spot. You see, I don't have a problem against cruiserweights. Actually, that was my favorite part of the show growing up was the cruiserweights because it stood out. Even the hardcore division, one of my favorites growing up because it stood out. Every division had its own marquee about it. Whether you're looking at the women's division, it speaks for itself. It's the women, the tag team division. You were looking forward to seeing people like Edge and Christian or the Hardys or the Deli Boys doing something in regards to TLC. Every time you looked around, you were waiting for a TLC match right you were waiting to see the hardy's edge and christian or the deli boys toss it up some way maybe you're waiting for too cool to, for scotty to do the, to do the worm right maybe you're waiting for right to censor to come out and okay maybe you weren't waiting for right to censor but you get what i'm saying though right you look at the hardcore division that speaks for itself the weapons the chaotic nature fighting backstage and all that other kind of shiz right you look at the european championship at the very least it was trying to see who are the up and coming stars of today right you look at the Intercontinental Championship. Okay, who's the guy who's next in line for the World Championship? And then obviously you have the World Championship. Every division was structured. It was structured. And it made it that much more wild. It made it that mo much more worthwhile when a guy actually achieved each status, right? And people are gonna hate it when I say this. They're really gonna hate it when I say this, but you need to hear this. And I feel like, if you had this actually implemented within professional wrestling like it used to be, it would just mean so much more, man. You keep talking about all these vanilla midges. That's why I get so upset when I see a guy like Warlow. Like that, that was just an everyday thing. And now he's become the anomaly within professional wrestling. Back in the days, it was a land full of giants, right? Nowadays, it's a land full of goddamn midgets, right? He's an anomaly that stands out so much, and it's already bad enough that it's unrealistic that you have guys like him or a Powerhouse Hobbs or a Braun Breaker taking pinfalls from the likes of a Carmelo Hayes, taking pinfalls from the likes of a goddamn Darby Allen, right? Taking pinfalls from the likes of just all these midget wrestlers that make no sense. A fucking Jungle Boy going out there and him pinning Brian Cage. Brian Cage also losing to women, making a mockery out of like, like out of larger than life superstars if you actually played your cars right and if you actually played the hand that you're dealt with professional wrestling was always cultivated as a male driven testosterone driven soap opera 
And I feel like people forget that, man. And you need to hear this. There are things in professional wrestling that are structured the way that they are because they're not only traditional, but they traditionally worked. You had real men. Real men. You don't have to be a big, buff, tough son of a bitch. But if you're not going to be a big, buff, tough son of a bitch, then you better be a brawler. You better be a person that just doesn't fucking throw weapon shots for the sake of fucking throwing weapon shots, John Moxley. You go out there and you kick somebody's ass. You go out there and you stump a mud hole in a motherfucker. You ain't got to throw out there and throw up, you know, middle fingers in their faces all the time just because you're so edgy. No, when Stone Cold Steve Austin threw a middle finger at somebody, that's him saying, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. That's him saying, I don't fuck with you, DTA. I don't trust you. And fuck you, I'm going to kick the shit out of you. It had meaning, it had reasoning versus John Moxley and Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara and all these random wrestlers throwing up middle fingers because, oh, look, mommy, I can stick my middle finger. AEW allows me to. That's the difference. You see these kids, they're cosplaying, sticking their middle fingers up in the air because, look, they're so edgy. When Austin did it, he meant business. There was a reason behind it. He wanted you to know that he hated you. And if you have a problem with that, then you can step up and then you come show out. And then they will brawl. They'll beat the shots. We got a bunch of punch. We got a bunch of kicks. People thrown into barricades. People thrown in a ring post. Actual fucking fights. Nowadays, you have all these choreographed routines going around. Oh, it's supposed to be a serious fight, but you're going to stop in the middle of a fight to do a cartwheel dive to the outside of the ring. Those spectacles were saved for the cruiserweight division because that's that that was their thing. That's how they got over. And I appreciated that. And you know what? When they got big enough, like a Rey Mysterio, then guess what? It's perfectly fine for them to come in the world championship division because then it makes sense. It's not to say that we don't want the cruiserweights to not be in the world championship division. What I'm saying is to have them there for the sake of having a good match when you can have that same good match in the cruiserweight division. Think about it for a second. I'll throw it out like this, right? So let's say for an example, Roman Reigns, Kevin Owens, Royal Rumble 2022, or was it 23? 2023, excuse me right all the story that was tied to it that's a main event caliber match that was a solid match main event solid fucking match you can go to earlier uh things like sting invader sting invader that was a main event quality superstar driven match look at austin and rock obviously austin and brett is another one there are multiple examples that you can look at and say that they don't wrestle like the cruiserweights, but they have some of the best matches of all time. No cruiserweight match that I can think of even comes remotely close to Bret and Austin. But at the same time, you still have great cruiserweight matches that get over like nobody's business. Eddie and Ray is the first thing that comes to mind. It's okay to be a fucking vanilla midget if you know your if you know your place. You knowing your place as a vanilla midget just it does wonders for the business because then people who actually have charisma, people who can actually structure their matches around fights that people come to want to see, and they're not fucking sitting there going, "Oh wow, that's really cool." Another 450 splash through a table would have been nice if you know he logically just moved out of the fucking way. But why put yourself in that position when all you have to do is throw hands, throw suplexes, okay? It's the story that matters. If you know what you're doing, like, fuck, D God damn it! look at Dragon Ball Z. I love using that metaphor for an example because it's so fucking easily to just look at and relate to. Look at Dragon Ball Z for an example, right? How many fights did you see before it even fully got started? It took them like, what, maybe two episodes. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, Gohan and Cell. Gohan and Cell, it probably took them like three or four episodes to build Gohan up to the point where he's now fighting Cell as a Super Saiyan 2. It's like three or four episodes. Remember, if you watched it, it took Cell beating Goku. Well, first he exploded and then, you know, Goku took him there and killed himself by accident. But it took Cell coming back. It took Cell throwing out the, the, the little Cell Juniors to, to beat the crap out of everybody. It took Cell to take out, uh, who was it, Android um, 16, and he stepped on his head. 
And then that's what finally triggered Gohan. It took like four fucking episodes to get to the point that Gohan fought Cell. Take that same mentality and instill it within professional wrestling. The same fucking mentality. I'll, th I'll throw this out there. And you guys are going to look at me fucking crazy as hell when I say this. I'm going to say it though. If you are a good performer, really, all you honestly need is a headlock. And you'll be like, what the fuck, Devontae, a headlock? Think about it for a second. If you were an awesome talent, if you were an actual fucking decent name, if you knew how to work a headlock to get people invested into the match, getting the guy to raise his arm, drop it, raise his arm, drop it, raise his arm, drop it, and then he gets it back up and he tries to fight back and you got him into another headlock again, right? You say to yourself, oh, that's really, really boring, right? But if you're a big enough name and people are chanting for you and they believe in what the hell you're doing and you see that audience chanting and getting rambunctious, you think I'm crazy? Rock and Hogan. Boom. Argument is over with. Rock and Hogan. They did the least amount of. I can't think of a match that did so little get so much out of it. Dusty Rhodes by himself made an entire career out of doing the bare minimum and got everybody invested into his matches everybody you can't get me one aew wrestler right now to even remotely compete with what hogan and andre did you can sit here and listen to Meltzer all you want to try to fill your head with this bullshit lies about, oh, it's a negative four-star match versus Kenny Omega and fucking Kazushika Okada having a seven-star match. Okay, cool. Kenny Omega, Kazushika Okada, have your seven-star match. Now let's go on the street and ask anybody who the fuck is Kazushika Okada and Kenny Omega versus who's Andre and Hogan. And what's the first thing they're going to tell you? What the fuck is a Kenny Omega in a cereal box? I have no clue who the fuck these GT... What, what, what the fuck is this, huh? Dragon Ball GT, Kenny Omega? Kazushika Okada? What the fuck, some anime? What the hell are you telling me? A comic book? A manga? What the fuck is this? Well, you say Hogan and Andre, almost 40 years later, they immediately think of Hogan slamming Andre. A simple body slam got over more than any of their seven-star matches combined could ever do for the wrestling business. And you sit here and you say, well, that's boring as shit. Yeah, it's boring when it's a bunch of fucking nobodies going out there trying to do basic wrestling moves. Then I take you back to someone more recent like a Roman Reigns and Jey Uso. Maybe not their match at SummerSlam, but go back to 2020. Another. How, the bare minimum. Their I Quit Hell in a Cell match. Their match prior to that. The bare fucking minimum. And they got so much out of it so much so you can't even say for an example oh well Devonta, you're trying to spout out these old timer things no one wants to see that yeah that's cool that's fine you hold on to that mentality you keep that mentality tell you what that's why you're living in this time frame and that's why you're on my channel picking and choosing what you're upset about picking and choosing what you like picking and choosing what time of the day is your period on before you get upset that i'm talking about your favorite superstar in a bad way you continue with that mentality Whereas I'll be sitting here with the memories in my head, knowing and understanding where professional wrestling would be right now if you weren't so obsessed with the end ring action, if you weren't so obsessed with putting these numbskulls out there, doing the fucking most, getting the, getting the bare goddamn minimum. Like I said, it's nothing offensive. I'm not attacking anybody in particular. I'm attacking the mentality. I'm attacking the mindset. I'm only speaking what Kevin Nash said that I'm bringing into fruition almost 20 years later. Like I said, Kevin Nash, what he said, I don't think he was talking about the actual effects, what was going on at the time. I think he was a prophecy letting you know, well, hell, if you're looking at what's going on right now. Understand that's the future of the business. And you say you like it now, but wait till you actually get it in a full bulk and it completely takes over professional wrestling and you get bullshit companies like, a like AEW, for an example. You get the indie wrestling scene making a mockery out of professional wrestling, telling you, well, guys, if you put your best foot forward and it has some thumbnails inside and it goes inside someone's face and it happens to have fire on that shoe, then gosh darn it, that's professional wrestling. Like what you like.
Yeah, like what I like. Like what I like. You know what I like to see? I like to see all these motherfuckers get out of the business. Go retrain and take the fans with you and retrain them. And then you guys come back and we can all do professional wrestling correct. Can we do that? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. Of course, obviously, you can always, you're always going to get, it's got to be one. It's got to be one. Might be two. Might be three. Might be four. Might be five. I don't know. Oh, Devante, how dare you talk about this wrestler that way? Oh, Devante, how dare you make a mockery out of my favorite wrestling style? What's your favorite wrestling style? Flipping. Gag me. Fuck my life. I'll be back later on tonight for the SmackDown review. As always, my name is Devante, and I'll be catching you guys later. Deuces, P, eyes.